How dare you wash your clothes in our drinking water, BB? Now how are we going to survive in this harsh, unforgiving terrain? All right, Donnie, make sure the wheel goes all the way around. Uh, oh, no. Head hunters. Ah, am I fired? In April of 2023, the entirety of the first season of the Total Drama reboot leaked online, thanks to the whole thing dropping in Italy on Discovery+. Plus. Oh, Given the show's history with leaks, this wasn't exactly the most shocking news. Total Drama fans are ravenous beasts that look for every possible smidgen of information and footage they can find in order to satiate their never-ending appetite. I would know. I am one. Overall, I'd say the season was a positive surprise in terms of quality. Not the best that the show's produced, but easily better than what they had put out in the years prior to the show's slumber. Still though, to have a whole season leak, and with no word of a release date for US folks, as well as literally everyone else in the world, it wasn't exactly a good sign, especially in this mass streaming world that we live in, where executives are just an inch away from the tax write-off button they have installed on their desk if a show isn't an instant success. But I mean, maybe we were looking too deep into this. I mean, what, are they just gonna leak the entirety of the second season too before even announcing a release date for the first season in the US and worldwide? <laughs> yeah, right, that'll be the day. Z as in, as in multiple days, since it leaked over a few weeks. You know, for a company called Discovery, you'd think they'd discover how inept they are at this. So from November 2023 to January 2024, the second season of the Total Drama reboot was released via leaks. Trust me, we're gonna talk about the drip feed leak later on, but for now, let's look at the actual content of the Total Drama reboot's second season. For those of you not in the know, last April, I looked at the first season of the reboot with my friend, The Wacky Deli, over on his channel. We gave our thoughts on the changes, the new characters, the idea of a new season in today's climate, and the messy leak and distribution issues, as well as other things. I highly recommend that you check out that video before continuing with this one. Link will be in the description below. Naturally, when the second season finally released, of course we were going to talk about it, but why not on Deli's channel again? Well, to coincide with the messiness of how these two seasons have both officially and unofficially been released, we thought it would be a good homage to have the two parts split up between our channels. Discovery, if you're watching this, hire us. We can play your game of making bad decisions too. This video will cover spoilers for both the first and second season of the reboot, so do keep that in mind. So, how does season 2 fare in regards to season 1, and for that matter, in regards to the show as a whole? Well, let's find out. Charlie Niner TDI holding course to Island, over. We're back! Last season was painfully delicious, and if you missed it, shame on you! But here's a very quick recap. So the big thing going into this season of Total Drama is that it's the first full-on legitimate sequel season. See, previous seasons of Total Drama are technically sequel seasons to the season prior, especially true for the first three seasons. However, those can also be seen as their own separate entities, and they're kind of designed in that way. Sure, the characters are the same between the seasons, and there are some plot points that do carry over in between seasons as well, but for the most part, you could watch almost any season of the show on its own, and while you may get lost or confused at some points, each season is also meticulously crafted so that, while a watch of previous seasons is beneficial to your watch experience, it isn't necessarily required for you to find enjoyment. Each season of the show, in the original run, for better or worse, has carved itself a unique identity, ergo why every season of the show has its own sort of name. Total Drama Action is technically Total Drama Island Season 2, but ask any fan for what they're worth, and they'll tell you that it's Total Drama Action. It is also Total Drama Island Season 2, but in convention and technicality alone. The new run is also able to carve its own identity, and has its own, albeit unofficial, naming convention of Total Drama 2023, or some spin on that. And while not exactly a perfect definition of what to expect, it is, basically, just 
Total Drama Island in the modern age. Which I know sounds ironic given the fact that every year the show came out, it was the modern age. But in the social media driven world of today, this applies now more than ever. That being said, the naming convention works for the first season of the new run. For all intents and purposes, season one of the new run is Total Drama 2023. Season two, in that regard, is already coming out of the gate with a massive handicap. On the surface, there is absolutely nothing separating season two from season one of Total Drama 2023. It uses the exact same intro, at the exact same location, with the exact same number of episodes, and for the first time ever, every single character from the first season makes a return for its second season. Previous seasons had returning characters, sure, but never to this caliber. This is a cool idea which we'll expand upon in a second, but it definitely doesn't help the case for season two being its own thing. Say what you will about the quality of seasons like All Stars and Pocketoo Island, they make it clear that they're their own things right out the gate. With Total Drama 2023 season two, you're at a lose-lose from the surface. If you look at it as its own thing, then it unfortunately blends together with the season that came prior to it. But if you look at Total Drama 2023 as a whole package of two seasons, it devalues the unique factors that each season has to offer and blends it all together. So in order to give this season a fair look over, I think we need to examine it as a sequel and as its own thing. To me personally, Total Drama 2023 season two is really good. As a sequel, I think it builds on what the first season did and is actually able to outshine it in almost every aspect. And as its own thing, I think it's able to nail the Total Drama staples without falling into any pitfalls that are too massive that even some of the most beloved seasons have a hard time venturing around, while also introducing its own little bits and pieces. All 16 contestants are back to do it all over again, which means this season, I don't even have to pretend to be nice. As I mentioned, every character from the first season returns this season, and it feels the most like a direct follow-up than any other season prior. Things that these characters said and did in that first 13 episode run feel like they continue to hold weight and leverage this time around. Not to say any of the original seasons weren't able to accomplish that because they were, but here it feels the most natural, at least to me. Given the unique circumstances of this season's cast, Deli and I will be covering the characters just like we did in the first video, which, uh, which again, you should have watched first, not gonna lie. And going over how they build upon what was established in the first season, as well as anything new and interesting they bring to the table. We will be shaking things up a bit in this part of the analysis, however, and you'll see what I mean soon enough. Oh, shit. Loser! Guys? You're a loser! Are you feeling sorry for yourself? I mean, right now is technically soon enough. So for the sake of not slogging the video down, we've decided to cover all the pre-merge eliminated contestants at once. The reason behind this is because, well, to be perfectly honest, there's nothing that substantial to really add to their characters that we didn't already make abundantly clear in that first video. So, first up we have Lauren, aka Scary Girl. Last season, she didn't really stick around for too long, but for what we got, she turned out to be a competent and entertaining contestant. In season two, her whole gimmick was that she was trying to act more normal, as she and the others credit her off-putting and scary demeanor as the driving force behind her early elimination. Turns out that uh, her effort to act normal is even more off-putting and scary, and she was the first eliminated from the game. As much as I personally liked her, I mean, it's not a huge loss in my opinion. Chase and Emma were also early boots this season, being eliminated second and fourth respectively. Unlike Scary Girl though, they actually made it pretty far last time. On the surface, their entire arc last season was their on again off again relationship, but like we mentioned last time, that did a disservice to the individual character moments and personality traits that they displayed. This season though, the writing was on the wall for both of them in each of their eliminated episodes, with Chase being too distracted to compete in the challenge and Emma's lack of people skills. They end up not being together at the end and I think that's probably for the best. If the show gets another season, the writers are going to find some way to have them go around again, mark my word. 
Millie made it to the final three last season, so I guess it only makes sense that she's the third eliminated from this season. I mentioned last time that I had a problem with how her character was handled, basically cruising to the finale on Priya's back while not really contributing that much. Looking back, given her reason for being there in the first place, it kind of makes sense that there's a bit of a manipulative strategy to her game, although I'm kind of surprised no one called her out on it. I am glad, however, that in this season, despite making up with Priya, they didn't completely drop her more manipulative tendencies, with her abusing Damien's trust to get their team to win the second challenge. Except this time, it actually blows up in her face, and she's voted off in the very next episode. Like Lauren, I didn't really feel like there was anything more to add with her character either at this point. So again, not a huge loss. And our last pre-merge contestant, Nichelle. Okay, so I'm gonna be walking on a bit of a tightrope on this one, since Nichelle here has become quite the popular character in the online community. And with her not making it far either last season, the fans have deemed her elimination as, quote, robbed both times. How do I feel? Ooh. So in the first season, it's revealed that action star Nichelle actually never performed an action scene in her life, and it was all stunt doubles and makeup leading to her team's loss and her elimination in the third episode. Definitely a bit of missed potential, but I wouldn't say robbed given the circumstances. In season two, thanks to her blunderous performance, she's a hashtag canceled Hollywood actor, and nobody respects her until she reveals in the very first episode that ever since her season one loss, she's actually been doing a lot of behind the scenes training. And now she's just as talented and athletic as she had portrayed herself in her movies. After all the ridicule and backlash she received, she's finally ready to prove everyone wrong and go for the gold. She's then promptly out of the game four episodes later. Now, she wasn't actually eliminated this time, instead opting to quit the game after finding a contract for a movie franchise deal. One that was forged by Julia as revenge for a beef between the two earlier on in the episode. We'll get more on that later, but between her two departures, this one definitely feels more deserving of the robbed status that the fans clamor for. Now, do I think she was robbed this season? Well, I don't know. See, I think she had a lot more potential this season than she did the other season, given the strength she had on display. And her getting out because of Julia could arguably be seen as a cop-out move to get her out early. That being said, between the reveal of her talent and her departure, there was literally nothing done with Nichelle at all. The fans were literally clamoring for any bits of character with her, to the point where I, no joke, saw a tweet or Reddit post of someone compiling the shots that Nichelle and Damien were in the same frame, and they were like, don't think I didn't notice all these shots, hard eyes emoji. They make a cute couple, huh? They certainly are standing next to each other. She stayed as long as she needed to, given how she was written. So in truth, if anything was robbed, it was the writer's ideas for Nichelle from the studio. Anyways, that's all the losers. So while we're pointing and laughing at them, now we can get to the characters that actually mattered this season. Starting with... Bullshit. Bullshit. Derivative. That. I love, I absolutely love. We're gonna talk about the other relationships in a different section, but this one is kind of too ingrained into these characters this season to dissociate, especially Axel since she was gone by episode two last season. So first off with Ripper, he made quite a name for himself in season one, both in the show and the fandom. Not gonna repeat myself completely from that first video, basically he was a character who was a jerk who used other people to further himself in the game and had an obsessive relationship with farting. But behind all that was a competent and determined player who made it farther than he probably should have. In season two, right away, the personality that he built for himself bites him in the ass, as even with characters as disliked as Julia and Bowie amongst the cast, he's still the last one picked to join a team. It's clear how basically everyone feels about him, and that no one willingly wants to spend time with him. 
Nothing much is really done with him in the first episode, but from episode 2 to episode 4, they take Ripper's character traits and go a completely different direction than what I was expecting. First and foremost, his farting and farting discussions have been reduced significantly in season 2. Needless to say, I was flabbergasted. Can the character of Ripper truly even exist if he does not flatulate? He's still an in-your-face guy who does his own thing for his own benefit, all to the disgust of everyone else. But he actually has a bit of a story this time around. See, he fancies someone on the island, and tries in vain to impress her at every turn. And that lady is none other than... Axel? It's the girl who ripped my heart out. The girl whose face will always be etched in my mind. Huh? We'll get more into this in a bit, but in having the character so focused on this escapade, they've drastically blunted the harshness of his character. Personally, I think it was a necessary change. I never hated Ripper in Season 1. I actually think he was quite adept at times. But there were a few moments where I felt they crossed the line a bit much with how much of an asshole he was. Anyways, he tries and fails on a few occasions to win Axel's heart over, until the end of Episode 4. We're after reading an honestly banger poem for Axel over the loudspeaker. Well, I'll let it play out for itself. This is gonna be bad. Yeah, can we show it decapitation or is that gonna be a problem? is an image that'll haunt my dreams. So given how Axel was eliminated in the second episode of the first season, you'd think that there wasn't a lot to go off of between the two characters leading up to this point. But no, there's actually quite a bit between these two, especially in the second episode. Granted, it's nothing but them arguing and hating each other, which easily could have led to the haters turn lovers trope in season two that I really, really hate. And yet, despite my disdain towards the trope itself, I don't know, for some reason in this single case, I don't mind, and it's all because of how the relationship between the two is executed. See, in Total Drama Action, Jeff and Bridget's entire time in the competition is spent with the two of them smooching. Um, I don't think this is the kind of action Chris had in mind. <laughs> and with Axel and Ripper, while it's not necessarily all the screen time between their initial hookup and their elimination, yeah, most of it is, especially after the two teams merge, and they're able to make it as graphic as they possibly can get away with for the TV rating they have. Honestly, the stuff they don't show on the screen is arguably even more disturbing. That is what their characters become until their double elimination in the seventh episode, and it might seem like they regress to more stereotypical tropes, but I honestly don't think that's the case. For one, I think the relationship is actually beneficial for both the characters, giving Axel some much-needed relevance in the show, and further allowing Ripper to show a softer side, at least as soft as Ripper can get. Second, unlike most relationships in the TD Extended Universe, this one actually lasts past the final episode, making it one of the most stable relationships in the show. Which is ironic, given that lastly, the stability of their relationship balances on the instability of the characters. Now yes, this cast is the most grounded characters the show have had since the first generation, but even these guys have their eccentricities. Other than possibly Scary Girl, you have two of the most eccentric characters in the show hook up and become an item, and you have a recipe for disaster of the most entertaining caliber. But thankfully, unlike other times, not a disaster of their relationship. Now I've seen people hating their relationship online given how out of pocket it seems, as well as certain headcanons people have for Axel. Being gay is misogynistic, so I would never do it. I like girls. See, I think people sometimes forget these characters are supposed to be teenagers, and teenagers make stupid, dumb, spur-of-the-moment decisions riled up by their hormones. The difference between something like this and, say, the aforementioned Jeff and Bridget stuff from Action is that that was a detriment to the characters' personalities and overall viewers' feelings of said characters. Whereas this builds upon the characters, allowing them to grow and flourish. It's why a scene like this... Can you two please just keep your hands to yourselves till I'm back? <sighs> We're not animals. Well, maybe sometime. Guys, I got the water seriously! What? 
We didn't even do anything! Is better than a scene like this. What was I thinking? Duncan is so right. I like Jeff, but hello, I also like a million bucks. Duncan's right. It's time to get our head in the game. Booyah! Mm, mm, mm. Like, do you really think that Ripper, a guy who said that showing emotion makes you less of a man, would have given up a million dollars for a chance to be with Axel in season one? Call it cliche, call it a waste of time, call it Jeff and Bridget 2.0, but to me? This might be one of the best relationships in the whole show. It made Ripper even more of a Giga Chad. What else could you possibly ask for? Z is the absolute goat, the legend, the chillest to ever do it. I ship him with orange soda all day every day. That's the only one that I really need in my life. Also, the way he was eliminated was awful. They literally just repeated the same elimination twice. It was fucking terrible. I think he actually has a lot of potential as a bit of a spoiler. He can pop up during uh, different parts of the season, Aiden challenges and shit. But instead, we gotta kick him to the curb whenever it's convenient. Get the fuck out of here. MK is a little bit of an enigma to dissect this season because she's easily one of the most changed and yet one of the least changed characters between seasons. Her biggest shift between season one and season two is that she's a lot more of a team player, especially in regards to one team member, but we'll get there in due time. In season one, she was someone who looked out for herself and played an under the radar game, but it came back to bite her when a combination of her pessimistic sarcasm and confessional spying got her kicked from the race right before the merge. Meanwhile, in season two, she's helping out the team whenever she can and is a lot less annoyingly sarcastic about messing up. While not the most strategic, she is able to play to the other characters' strengths and get them to do what she wants and go along with her plans. That said, however, her backhandedness is still very much intact from the first season, and in fact, I'd say it's maximized even further here, with her outright cheating in order to get her team the wins in the back half of the pre-merged episodes. It's a central focus of the Skunk Butt storyline for those episodes, and I think it's handled pretty well for the most part, especially in the case of MK. I mean, her introduction to the show is her literally pickpocketing someone. I'm not exactly shocked she would cheat to win. Granted, she's found out come the merge, yet she still manages to play a dishonest game up until her elimination. Frankly, I don't think we reached our proper quota of Toontastic Tyler tributes in the previous video, but I actually have something serious to say about this character, so I guess we'll hold off. We'll save it for the, the second round of reboot seasons. But out of anybody in this cast, it was probably the most rewarding to see Damien grow and improve and change and actually become a competitor. He is still fundamentally the same person that landed on the island not knowing anything. But it's cool seeing how much bravado he has later on, which makes it all the more preposterously fucked that he was eliminated the way that he was. I don't know if I would entirely say we were robbed. I mean, robbed of his presence? Yes. Robbed of a win? Mm, probably not. I mean, any excuse to see more of Damien is, is totally fine by me. But if you look at the elimination order, it seems like an appropriate place for him to have gone. If we weren't obsessed with adding 6,000 twists to the stories to make each elimination more spicy than they needed to be, then this, would, this probably wouldn't even be an issue. Alas, we had to lose one of the greatest to ever do it. Out of all the post-merge characters, Wayne and Raj changed the least between seasons. And I mean that in the best way possible. They were peak in season one, and they continue to be peak in season two. Raj got more development in season one than Wayne, starting a relationship with Bowie, but for the most part, they were pretty much neck and neck. Going into season two, it seemed like it would be the same song and dance as season one, where they're just there to have a good time and share a single brain cell. Looking a bit deeper, however, there are some differences that form between the two, although none for the worse. There are very subtle changes to how Raj is handled in Season 2 compared to Season 1. Although they may seem to share an IQ level, it seems as though Raj is the brighter of the two, able to pick up on things quicker than Wayne. I think this is wrong! 
Quick, tell me what's happening. Our team is cheating again. <gasps> very, very wrong. And in the beginning of season one, Raj is definitely more of the emotional anchor in the relationship between him and Bowie, something that we'll be discussing very soon. As I said, none of this is to the detriment of either Raj or Wayne's characters. Under the guise of, quote, shaking things up, they could have easily introduced a slew of different things to force drama, but they didn't. They grazed upon a few ideas in sub-episodes, but for his time on the show, they kept Raj as a loyal best friend to Wayne and a loving boyfriend to Bowie and exited the show as gracefully as a snow owl. Priya managed to remain pretty likable throughout both parts. It's kind of cool she managed to have two full narrative arcs. The first one, of course, being her, her path to victory tied in with her friendship with Millie. And this one, of course, being tied into another competitor we'll get into a little bit later. I do find this to be a bit of a mild complaint, but they definitely had more room to explore her relationship to Total Drama as a franchise in conjunction with her fucked up childhood. I would have liked to have seen someone take accountability because, I mean, all, all of this... This? I, <laughs> yeah, something needed to be said here. Julia is in a bit of an interesting position this time around. See, for basically the first half of the first season, she had to keep up this nice girl facade until that all came crashing down right before the merge where her true color shone, and she was allowed to be her real conniving self. Going to this season, everything is basically painted on the wall already, so there's nothing that she could really hide. And yet, she still somehow managed to make it to the final three, despite her reputation. And that's weird to think about, because aside from one other thing that we'll talk about later, Julia basically played the same game that she played last time. I think her smaller strategy plays were better this season, like getting Nichelle to quit the game and getting the one-up on Damien's idol, which, by the way, I saw some people saying it was worse than Heather's idol play in All-Stars, which I heavily disagree with, due to there being actual reasoning and strategy behind Damien needing to constantly hide the idol, but uh, we'll let that be for now. But with all that said, and my general opinion that her placement in the final three was more than deserved, I do wish that her moves weren't portrayed in such a tell-don't-show manner, where we're only told about things after the fact. It helps with tension, but doesn't really do much to make her seem like a strategic player. Between both parts of the season, Julia was easily given the most time to experience a full evolution. As an antagonist, she's decent enough given the makeup of the cast, but she also managed to captivate half the fandom without even trying. I mean like literally without even trying. She is operating at a Jerry Manthe while all of her stands hype her up as THE Russell Hans. And I will- I, I don't think I'll understand it. You have previous seasons that feature actual icons. Decent strategy be damned. I remember the ice skaters being well liked, but I don't- I don't think they were getting this much shine. Come on. What- what, what is this? Caleb is the most total drama of all time literally being the first casualty of 2023's first season. His run in the second is much more thoughtful and deliberate. He exists in a very particular vacuum where he's not distinct enough to be considered a real character, nor is he close enough to past archetypes that he could be considered too derivative. His non-existent personality listlessly floats within the realm of total drama purgatory without much of a fuss. Otherwise, he's a decent enough general competitor. I remember when the first scene of the second season leaked and people online were pointing out how Caleb had this cool strategic face on and how he seemed to be a lot more no-nonsense. The speculation behind those scenes being a possible implication that he would act as this season's antagonistic force, possibly bitter due to his early departure in season one. In actuality, what we got was almost the complete opposite. A guy who likes to do good unto others, and takes his grandma's words about being an honest man at heart. Kinda would have preferred if he did play more of an antagonistic role, but whatever. Wayne is the unabashed goat of this season, and I'm tired of people pretending otherwise. Wayne has got to be in the top five of total drama goats. Anybody who disagrees is a poop mouth with poop opinions, and they are not to be respected in this video. But seriously, it was cool to see him win. He's a good guy. He deserved it after everything he's endured. 
And I mean, the money's not being put to good use, but like, it, it doesn't most of the time anyway. Who gives a shit? He is a titan among men. An icon amidst icebergs. The Gretzky of total drama do-goodery. And by Gretzky, I mean, of course, Owen, because those two figures are clearly on par with each other. I mean, come on. There's honestly not a lot to say about Wayne this season as compared to last season. Nothing much changes. And I think that's part of why Wayne's win is so important, because you don't need to go through some character-defining arc or be the most strategic player to win. Sometimes you could just be a lovable goofball, and that's good enough. Almost like people forgot how season one played out. Hmm, that's, that's really weird. The reason why seeing him win was so cool, it mainly has to do with this mirroring the ethos of how the end of the first season was held. As polarizing as he could be, Owen was very much the face of the show for being representative of the series' crude humor and surprising sense of heart. He doesn't grow or change over the course of the season, and frankly, he didn't need to. He didn't even play to win, which made him the most deserving of the prize in an emotional sense. You can dislike Owen and acknowledge the significance behind this narrative choice. To that end, I can see a favorable connection between that competitor and the reboot at large. The latter didn't need to be here by any means, but it gave 110% of itself every step of the way. It knows itself better than anyone else, and while it does aim to compete, the goal of the show is to make watching along a fun experience. It wanted to be a decent addition to the franchise without taking itself so seriously that it collapses under its own weight, which is a subtle balance for a total trauma reboot to uphold. The more things change, the more things stay the same. To cap off just how great Wayne is, I think it's important to mention something that he managed to accomplish that literally no other competitor that appeared in multiple seasons has. Given how his ejection in the first season was based on a medical evac and not a vote, Wayne is the only multi-season player on the entire show to play a perfect game. Dude did not receive one single vote from the time he first arrived on the island, and I think that's an important feat to mention. One of many feats to add to the greatness of Wayne. Caleb and I would make a great couple. And I think he might be thinking that too. Priya and I will make an unstoppable alliance. And I know she's thinking the same thing. Alongside the individual characters, there's also the relationships and bonds that are present and formed within the season. And other than Axel and Ripper's, Whatever was going on over there. There were two big relationships that formed this season, as well as a bit of a deeper look into two more relationships that were previously established. Functionally speaking, Caleb does not become a character without being attached to this arc with Priya. It's pretty one note, and there's no shortage of people who won't let you forget it. But for what it is, I think it's charming enough. Granted, I don't think my expectations were set too high, and thankfully there was no real attempt at a surprise twist made to keep things interesting. Putting these two together doesn't result in sparks flying, but what we got was relatively earnest. It is the most basic bitch ship development possible, and given the others that they've set up, I can't be mad that this one was coasting on lukewarm vibes, I really can't. People seem to be, uh, a touch critical of it. And admittedly, there are way more interesting dynamics that could be explored. So instead, let's just pivot to the real MVPs of the season. So like I mentioned before in the Julia section, there was one thing she did differently in season two than her season one endeavor, and it definitely helped her get as far as she did. That being her alliance and relationship with MK. Now, she had alliances in the past, heavy, heavy quotes, but those were basically formed out of desperation from other players that barely lasted past an episode or so, or what essentially boils down to blackmail. With MK though, the writing was on the wall from the first episode of this new season. You wouldn't think so given how in the first season, they really didn't interact all that much or have any major chemistry. In fact, they beefed pretty hard right before the merge, when MK revealed to everyone just how awful of a person Julia was. But no, right from the very beginning of the new season, the two of them seem to be hitting it off pretty well. Julia and MK bring out the worst in each other, and I mean that in the best way possible. What were once just a faux-positive influencer whose downfall caused her strategic uprise, 
and a snarky, sarcastic loner who played a subtle game from the shadows with an equally shady moral compass, transformed into one of the best and most strategic alliances and friendships on the entire show. The two of them were basically the driving force behind the cheating storyline for their team, and honestly, given the fact that the team didn't win any challenges until they did start cheating, it gives some weight to their strategic gameplay this time around. If it was only the cheating, then there wouldn't be much to write home about, but they were doing this alongside going out of their way to sabotage the other team, and basically keeping their number one enemy on their team, that being Bowie, in their back pocket, with the allure of allowing them all to stay just one more day on the island. It was a great move on their part, given that Julia's inclusion on the team could be seen as nothing more than an early boot. And then, basically the second the teams merge, they make Bowie regret his choice in keeping her around by shifting the blame of cheating from MK onto him. And it actually works. We've seen just how messy villain alliances and relationships can get over the years of this show, so color me shocked when it turns out that the bond formed between these two is one of the most stable that I think I've ever seen in this entire game. From moment one this season, both their cards are on the table for the other one to see, and neither one plays a dirty move against the other. In fact, the only time that even came close to happening is when it was clear that one of the two of them was going home. And even then, they both handled the elimination with a surprising amount of rapport. Like, they actively remained friends throughout the whole thing, even with MK leaving the island yet again thanks to Julia. It's not seen as a backstab move, in fact, MK is more impressed with how Julia managed to pull it off. Their little scene at the end of the episode before MK gets carried off is really cute, and I'm just happy to finally see a relationship between two antagonists in the show where, where everything is just laid out, there's nothing, there's nothing hidden between the two. Hell, even at the end of the season, she's there supporting Julia up until the very end, even after she loses out once again on a million. Now, you're probably wondering something that uh, I haven't mentioned yet, uh, and you're probably like, is he going to mention it? Is he going to gloss over it? But uh, there, there's a big question here. Is their relationship more than just a friendship? I guess that really depends on how you look at it. As soon as the two of them started hitting it off in the first episode of the season, the fans took notice, and the Mculia ship was formed. I am like 80% sure that's not how it's supposed to be pronounced, but whatever. And for once, it wasn't just the case of the characters standing, standing next, next to, to each, each other. other. There were some real sparks flying. It's clear that there was this strong bond between the two, but in universe, there was never anything confirmed. And even taking the social media with Terry, there was never any outright confirmation of whether these characters were more than just friends. And uh, he's, he's probably going to say something the day that I post this invalidating my entire point right now. But with how the two of them talk and act and interact, I mean, clearly there's something more there, right? They like each other or not, I can't tell. Here's my two cents on the matter. In addition to them bringing out the best slash worst in each other, they also allow the other to develop in ways that I don't think would have been possible without their bond. Julia outright states that her plans for the million this time around were to start a podcast with MK. Like that is not something Julia would ever do in the first season. And MK, who basically just hated people in the first season, is shown supporting and backing Julia, even when no one else would. The two of them make the other one do things that they wouldn't do for anyone else, without even second-guessing their own actions. That, alongside their flirty dialogue, doesn't outright prove a romantic relationship. But I think it's safe to say that it's something much bigger and more special than a friendship. In contrast, Raj and Bowie was that one dynamic that got consistent, overt focus throughout each part. In the barest sense, you could argue that part one succinctly wrapped up their story as a duo in a narrative sense, meaning whatever was to be done with them here, it would very much take on like side quest type energy, you know what I'm saying? The next logical step to take in developing this relationship would be to explore how each of them compete alongside each other. Broadly speaking, both of them are pretty decent competitors, 
but they have two quite distinct play styles and philosophies. Part one, in the context of this ship, was mainly framed around Raj's perspective, in the sense that he had a lot of uncertainty, some mixed feelings to unpack, and this more trepidatious side of him paired off well with this bold, golden retriever type energy we get from him. Unfortunately, this didn't really leak into their gameplay, because Bowie was able to very directly pivot away from that whole question by saying, hey, we should put this on the back burner for now. We got a game to play. So to this end, part two was the perfect opportunity for them to try and flush out this side of the dynamic. Unfortunately, we had a bit of a misfire in that regard. I do kind of understand what direction they were going in, but this wasn't really an opportunity for the two of them to actually develop as people. You just kind of used them as plot devices. If we wanted to dovetail off of the previous part well, most of this would be coming from Bowie's perspective. And despite the fact that he is literally sandwiched in between Julia and all of her crazy schemes and the hockey boy's ethics, I don't f really feel like I know what's going on in his head half the time. Like, this is just a tricky situation for him to be in, but I don't think either of them are really given the opportunity to respond to that, because we're, we're constantly put in the moment of reacting to Julia's next scheme and seeing how they'll pivot away from it. it it's like, uh... It's like Total Drama Death Note over here. It's nothing but mind games. So it kind of takes the focus off of them, which is regrettable. You know, they didn't have a whole lot of time in the previous part, but they, they managed to get their point across. I just kind of wish they were given more consideration here. Now with the Hockey Bros, not a whole lot has changed between the two of them in this season. They remain best friends throughout the whole season, and there's never really any tension or drama spats between the two of them. They may not have many brain cells, but the ones they do have are perfectly in sync. I'm very glad they didn't go down any routes of creating artificial drama between the two with, I don't know, Bowie or something, putting a strain on their friendship, which would have just been extremely forced and just unfun to watch. Even with that though, I think there's still some stuff we can dissect this season. With the two of them being booted together last season, we never really got to see how one thrived without the other. This season remedied that, with Raj's elimination in the final five. Come the next episode, we have a few scenes of Wayne depressed and sad, but nothing really more outside of that. However, when it comes to the episode's challenge, we get a bit more insight into their friendship. Basically, it involves the contestants facing their fears, and Wayne's fear happens to be him and Raj playing on different hockey teams. You'd think that, given everything we've seen up to this point, Wayne would completely freak out upon the sight of this. And for a bit, he definitely does. But in a rare moment of clarity for the character, he realizes that something like this was bound to happen eventually, and even though they're playing for different sides, it doesn't mean that they aren't still friends. It's a simple lesson, and a quick one, but it's one that I think strengthens their friendship, without needing to go through any unnecessary drama. Wanna go for Zaw after the game? <laughs> Fine! We'll do Salmon again! When she's watching, you better stand still. Or else. Or else what? Raptors? Rabbit tapeworms? Tell us already! Damien! Whoa! It's day one! Relax! Not much to say about the challenges this time around. I think they're pretty on par with the ones from the previous season. For the most part, they straddle that line between simplistic genius and cartoonishly over the top, while not going too overboard. There is one thing I did want to bring up, though, that I think is worth noting with two of the challenges, specifically the ones in episode one and four. They, um, they bore a striking resemblance to the challenges from Squid Game. And look, I know Squid Game didn't invent red light, green light, but it's a little strange that Total Drama's challenge also took place in a farm-like setting. I'll let you off with a warning this time, Chris, but uh, I got my eyes on you. As far as eliminations go, we could probably argue that nothing of note really happened. This season carries over whatever issues we had previously with part one, and if anything, it, it might slightly improve upon its approach, but a lot of it is just kind of the same 
contrivances weaved into this effort to try and keep you on your toes and everything. I think purely based on where my expectations were, I guess I was less dissatisfied this time around. There were still a couple of eliminations that I thought were stupid, absolutely bogus. But at the same time, I, I think the writers should have gotten a bit more grace for their ordering here, especially since it, it seems more purposeful with the way it was executed. We know these characters now, everybody has something to do, their motivations are clear enough within the context of the story and within the wider arc of the season. So in season one of the Total Drama reboot, there were a couple cameos, but they were basically all in the first episode and some of them were just someone wearing a mask or cardboard cutouts. In season two, they really upped the ante on the cameos for better and uh, and and kind of worse too. You got standard stuff like the cameos of characters in the form of obstacles and, and very brief blink and you'll miss it stuff. But there are two cameos in particular that go above and beyond in that they play a vital role in how the episode plays out. The first one is Police Cadet MacArthur from Redonkulous Race who has since been promoted to Marine K-9 unit leader. She looks relatively the same, and it's not super shocking to see her here. She was a recurring character in Drama Rama, so if any character was to make a cameo, hers would be the least shocking. She's entertaining and has good chemistry with the rest of the cast. The other cameo is Owen. And, um... Okay, I could suspend my disbelief for MacArthur, but uh, I'm going to need a little bit more explanation for this one. Apparently, this show takes place 15 years after the original, which lines up with things like Frio's audition tape. Like, I can believe that. But you mean to tell me that in the 15 years between the original Total Drama Island season and the reboot season, he looks exactly the same? Like, yeah, he looked the same in Redonkulous too, but even with the wonky in-universe timeline, this has to be like what? five to ten years after that show? And still, he looks and sounds identical, clothes and all? I mean, I get why. They probably had the old model and didn't want to make any big changes, but honestly, it took me out of it right away. Still a fun cameo. Owen's always a good time, but I kind of wish they put more thought into this. Speaking of Owen, that leads into the last thing I wanted to discuss before moving on to the next big thing. So keep in mind that for this part, this is all just speculation as nothing has been confirmed or denied, at least as far as I can tell when writing this. But given how things have lined up with these past two seasons, I don't think there's an alternate ending for either of them. Now hear me out on this one. So in season one, or the version that everyone saw, Freya was the winner of the show, but it was edited in a way that honestly, either of them could have won. And it could have been a very easy animation change and alternate line takes, nothing too out of the ordinary for the show. Coming into season two, however, right off the bat, things seem a bit off. Everyone is just acknowledging that Priya is the winner of the first season and that Bowie was the runner up. And honestly, again, you could change a few lines and alternate animation here and there, but this seems like a lot of extra work for something that they're so concretely telling us. Even so, it's not impossible. There was an alternate version of the TDI special where Gwen had won, so it's not unheard of. That being said, there are three nails in the coffin that make me think that this is true. First, in the first episode of season two, they allow the team captains, Freya and Bowie, to pick their teammates, and they have Priya pick first due to her being the winner of season one. That is a lot harder to change than the other instances especially with things like Caleb lamenting over being picked fifth overall. Something that wouldn't really be possible if Priya didn't pick first. Second, past the first episode of season two, it's mentioned multiple times that Priya is the champion, mostly from Caleb. Again, just a lot of extra work to go in and redub those lines. But the third and final nail in the coffin, at least for me, is the season two finale. See, up until this point, every finale has always been a race between two people or groups. Now sure, some seasons had finales with three, but there was always a cutoff mark where the last person to reach the cutoff would be cut from the race and the third place, leaving the other two to race to the end. 
With the second reboot season, it's three finalists racing to the finish line the entire time. There's no cutoff. There's no definitive third place. It's just three people trying to get there. So if there was an alternate ending, there'd actually have to be two alternate endings. And what's more, the way this finale ended, there was a clear first place winner, but there was no clear second or third place winner. So that would lead to even more confusion and needless work. Like I said, it's all speculation right now, but with how things are playing out, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the case. I'm not sure why. Maybe it just wasn't in the budget, or maybe they just decided to give it a more definitive canon. Now, this is just a theory, a film theory, but maybe they were told they couldn't do it because the show was being made for streaming first. So I can imagine it would have been more difficult to coordinate how alternate versions of episodes would go up on the same streaming service in different regional locations. Again, it's just a theory, a film theory, but uh, on the topic of streaming, I think it's finally time to cover this beast. Chase, what are you doing? The challenge is about to start. Check it, bro. I'm gonna film the greatest water slide stunt in history. It's already being filmed. <laughs> this is a TV show. Yeah, but I'm filming too. So back in April of 2023, the entirety of the first season of the reboot leaked. The whole season leaking was due to the fact that the entirety was dumped on Discovery Plus in Italy with the English dub. This time around, Discovery Plus Italy drip-fed the entire season, with episodes being released on a weekly basis, starting November 27th, 2023, with the first episode releasing and leaking. The following week, another three episodes dropped on December 4th. After this, episodes were released on a semi-frequent schedule, with two episodes dropping the following week on the 11th, and two episodes dropping on the 18th. After that, however, it was all quiet on the Western Front. Nothing more was dropping on Discovery Plus Italy, and there were no signs of anything dropping soon. It wasn't until January 13th, 2024, almost a month later, that the remaining five episodes were finally released. On the BBC iPlayer in the UK, to say this was a messy release would be an understatement. I mean, what the hell was going on here? It's one thing to want to release the episodes weekly instead of batch dropping. I get it. I prefer that way too, since it builds up hype. But whoever was in charge of this release window dropped the ball. Hard. I remember waking up to the news that part one had dropped. It almost didn't feel real considering what information we already had. It was kind of cool to be able to watch it all in one day, albeit partially out of obligation, but it certainly wasn't fair to most people. It did generate short-term buzz, and I figured, hey, as long as we're all aware, for next time, maybe this will be a net benefit. But then when that second half started to drop, there wasn't any regard given for consistency. Two episodes here, five episodes there, no sense of timing to be found. This was presumably done to overcorrect from part one, but we could definitely argue that this made it even harder to keep up with each drop. The new episodes still had to be sourced from Italian Discovery, plus each time more was released. They had to be retrieved with the original English audio attached, downloaded, re-upped where people could find it, and all of that adds extra waiting time onto each drop's release schedule. It puts the burn in slow burn. Total Drama is no stranger when it comes to fucked up worldwide release schedules. There's no shortage of instances where episodes and winners have leaked due to other countries having the show aired for them first. This time, however, this feels different, and in the worst way possible. The TD reboot, while having the name of the classic series, is sort of a clean slate for the show. It's supposed to rejuvenate the interest in these kinds of shows for a new era, and with the quality of the show itself, I think it manages to do so. However, taking into context the other factors involved with this rejuvenation effort, this is easily one of the worst releases I think I've ever seen. The show had its whole first season leaked and dumped in April of 2023, and its second season followed suit in its entirety by January of 2024. All of this without anything hinting at the show making its debut in the US anytime soon at all. No interviews, no ads, no trailers, nothing. And because this is a show specifically made for streaming, that means that advertisements were already going to be at an all-time low anyways. 
So that doesn't bode well for it releasing anytime soon. How does something like this even happen? Who's at fault here? It's easy to just point fingers at Zazlav and Warner Bros. Discovery like always, and I wish it could be that simple again. But I don't know, something about this seems extremely more complicated and messy. Which will probably mean the reasoning behind this distribution debacle will be all the more erroneous. I can easily see additional info coming to light a couple years down the line. American entertainment is in such a weirdly turbulent place that nothing quite makes sense anymore. Things are so bad, they started bringing back the fucking Disney Toon sequels and putting them in theaters as if that made any sense. Any explanation of what might have happened wouldn't make up for them fumbling as bad as they did, but it might provide someone with a sense of closure. My personal crack theory is that they maybe not so accidentally ended up focus testing too close to the sun, and they just happened to waste a full 26 episodes of reboot without considering what franchise they were dealing with here. As of the time of recording, the Total Drama reboot has only been officially screened in a handful of countries, fully dubbed in their respective languages. With the exception of the United States, both halves have been made available throughout the Americas on streaming and terrestrial television. Meanwhile, the UK and Australia carry it outside of that region, undubbed, of course. The only other country that lies outside of those regions would be Italy, a dominant market for the franchise. In the grand scheme of things, this country's impact on the show wouldn't be particularly noteworthy. Historically, they all hold significant populations of people that follow the show. I would say also that Italy has a unique relationship to animation, but that's, that's certainly not exclusive to them. As far as I can tell, regular TV still holds a fair amount of prominence overseas, to the point where a lot of media known to us as cable originals are aired on free TV over there. This reboot had access both to an audience on streaming and public television, and assuming you deployed a batch of episodes properly, you could, in theory, try and gauge how to handle similar rollouts internationally. Now this is all well and good, Except for the part where they dumped 100% of the content they'd be testing for, and didn't say a word. This is a series that was the serialized cartoon of the day. A decade before Hell House, Amphibia, a couple years before Gravity Falls even. You had to stay up to date each week while it was running in order to not get spoiled. If you drop too much of it at once, there's less incentive for people to actually keep up with it, and the hype goes right along with it. As unbalanced as Cartoon Network's previous releases were internationally, I don't think they ever crossed over into this weird territory where we can suddenly drop half a show in one day and piecemeal the rest of it over the course of mere weeks. A veritable smorgasbord of a shit show that we have in our hands here. Look at it. It's... It's all shit. With season two coming to an end, that's all she wrote for the time being. As of writing this, there's no more confirmed seasons of the show being produced, as the show hasn't been greenlit for a season three. So the big question is, what does the future look like for Total Drama? Now on the bright side, Terry said that the numbers were really looking good for season one and two of the show, so that should help in the show's favor. But, like, which numbers are these referring to specifically? And honestly, the bigger problem with the leak, this time in particular, comes with the fact that this show is supposed to be a, quote, Max original. Unfortunately, with entertainment nowadays, especially shows made for streaming, corporations and executives expect instant success, and anything they see that does not meet their extremely high bar, they have no problem canceling on a whim. We've just got to accept the fact that Fox has to make room for terrific shows like Dark Angel, Titus, Undeclared, Action, That 80s Show, Wonder Falls, Fast Lane. It's an unfair measurement and an unrealistic skin, expectation, girls club, but it's unfortunately the world we live in this. now. And since these two seasons have both leaked and aired fully before any news of a US release, I'm not sure if the max numbers are going to hit that bar. Another wonderful season filled with pain and misery. But no matter how hard we try, it always ends with someone happy. Well, hopefully we can change that on the next season of Total Drama Island! 
So we started this video talking about the second season of the reboot, and ended it talking about its uncertain future. It seems bleak, but let's circle back to the positives to wrap up this video. Total Drama Season 2 was put in the unfortunate situation of having to be a worthy successor to the first season, and stand out enough so that it could be viewed as its own thing. As a sequel, I think it did an amazing job building on plot threads that were introduced in the first season, as well as create new ones that gave new depth to characters that were either one note, or looked upon poorly, or were desperately underdeveloped. And, as its own thing, I think it solidified itself as one of the better seasons that the show has to offer, with tight writing, great character moments, and a surprising lack of bullshit, despite what people online might say. Gonna be honest, I don't think I've seen a cast this widely loved since the Gen 1 cast. Like at the very least, there's no character here that I'd say doesn't have a somewhat sizable fan backing. I can't really say that for characters like Leonard. Or Stacy. Or... Fucking Dave. Especially not Dave. Fuck Dave, honestly. All my homies hate Dave. Ultimately, poorly distributed Total Drama is better than no Total Drama at all. And as frustrating as this particular case may be, we do have more time to take account of where we're all at with this show. Despite its long-standing success, I have to imagine bringing this franchise back gets harder with each new iteration. Consumer attitudes and industry standards have evolved a bunch since the mid-2000s, to the point where pitching this revival could be seen as bizarro world territory. It's raunchy, edgy, and surprisingly relatable, which is somehow completely in line with our taste today, but also pretty different from what we're being offered in much of television. They came in here to slay, and by many accounts, they did that with flying colors. Honestly, I think that even if the show is over now, we got a totally worthy addition to the Total Drama lineup. I do hope that we get more seasons, and if Total Drama 2023 seasons 1 and 2 are anything to go by, I think the show's in good hands. Next time though, maybe you have a cameo that makes more sense, and one that the fans are actually clamoring for.